Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our weekly astronomy seminar from the Astronomy Department of the University of Sao Paulo. Today, we have the pleasure of receiving Professor Natalia Valle Assari from the Univers Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, presenting her work entitled uh, The Importance of the Diffuse Ionized Gas and Dust Attenuation for Global Properties of Galaxies. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Natalia, for accepting our invitation. Um, and here's a quick bio from Professor Natalia. She did her joint PhD at uh, UFSCI and the Observatory of Paris in France until 2010. Then she held a postdoc position in Cambridge. And she has been a professor at the University of Santa Catarina since 2014. In 2018, she got a Newton Advanced Royal Society Fellowship, uh, which allowed her to take a sabbatical leave in St. Andrews in Scotland. In 2000, 2019, she received the Carolina Names Prize given to early career female physicists by the Brazilian Society of Physics. So uh, we'll begin the, the presentation and I'll ask for everyone except the speaker, the speaker to turn off your cameras and microphones in order to avoid unwanted noises and interruptions. Uh, all the questions will be addressed to to Professor Natalia at the end of her presentation. And for those on YouTube, please write your questions in the chat anytime and I'll read them at the end of the presentation also. Okay, please, Professor Natalia. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here and for inviting me. I'm going to stop sharing my presentation. And here we go. There it is. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you today about the diffuse ionized gas and uh, I'll briefly talk about dust attenuation in the end. Uh, and this, um, this talk is focused on every type of galaxy. Here I'm showing a star forming galaxy M33 and you see that this galaxy has a lot of things going on, lots of star forming regions, H2 regions and sometimes when we are in a hurry, when we don't have enough data, we just treat a whole galaxy like this as if it were a very simple uh, H2 region and I'm going to tell you why this is a problem sometimes. Okay, so I like to start my talks with the takeaway message so you can all go and sleep afterwards, even though I don't see you, right? So you could be sleeping right now. But the takeaway message is this. Um, this is a famous uh, plot, the empirical law for galaxies, which has three parameters for galaxies. So let's see the three parameters. So in the x-axis is the star formation rate. So how many stars were formed yesterday? Um, the y-axis is the um, oxygen abundance in the gas. So gas phase oxygen abundance. So that's the metallicity, the chemical enrichment of a galaxy. And there are about 100,000 galaxies in this plot. Even though you don't see it, they are there, but they are each, um, all the galaxies are binned into those lines here, and those lines are binned in total stellar mass. So you see that this thing here and this thing here, they are anti-correlated when the mass is low. So there's an anti-correlation here. And as you go to higher masses, the anti-correlation disappears and it starts to be flat. That's the normal way the old um law that we had the uh how do we call this mass metallicity star formation rate relation okay and this relation is really important for people who do chemical evolution of galaxies but we are forgetting that galaxies have this diffuse component and if we remove the diffuse component this is the effect of removing it so i'm just plotting here the same lines as before 
in dashed lines. And here now the full lines are when we remove the dig and you see that it makes an effect where we had like no correlation at all, now we have a correlation. And that's just a, a small effect now, but it's because we don't have very good data yet. I'm going to tell you a bit more about this. So that's the takeaway message of my, my talk. The dig is really important if you worry about galaxy evolution. Okay, so let's start with a broad picture of galaxies. So um, why are we interested in galaxy histories and galaxy enrichment? Because it's a very rich way of uh, seeing how the universe evolves, right? So in a galaxy, let's start with this uh, thing here. Molecular clouds, they can cool down and there's that can be gravitational collapse of the gas and this gas can form stars. So those no, new stars, they um, form stars of all different types, very massive stars. They are going to live very, uh, very little and they're going to explode in supernova. These supernova can um, throw gas away from the galaxy. Uh, other stars just live a little longer and they lose their mass. And as they live, they transform hydrogen into helium, into carbon, and they make new chemical elements, which are going to be expelled to the interstellar medium of a gas, uh, interstellar medium of a galaxy again, and can be used in new uh, generation of stars. So there is this cycle within the galaxy where new generation of stars enrich the galaxy. But also there is some um, uh, there are some interactions with gas that uh, it's taken away from the galaxy in outflows and gas that inflows and, and rains down into the galaxy. That this could be like chem chemically enriched gas that has been expelled, had been expelled before, or poorly, uh, very metal poor gas from the halo, right? So there is this interaction between the, the galaxy and the halo. And there are interactions between galaxies, which can just wreak havoc in this picture. They, can uh, have um, can induce starbursts and things like that. So we see that the chemical enrichment of a galaxy is linked to its star formation history. It's also linked to interactions with the medium. And uh, if you're not interested in the in galaxy histories, if you're interested, for instance, in cosmology, what I'm going to tell you today is also important for important for cosmology. Uh, how and why? Okay, I just saw a talk about Wendy Friedman, uh, where she was telling us about uh, the using CFITs to to see how uh, the di to measure distances to very high uh, high redshift star, uh, galaxies, and uh, she said that in some cases you have to use H two regions near the CFITs to measure the metallicity of the region around the CFID, so you can really use the period luminosity relation correctly. So even if you do cosmology, uh, chemical abundances are important to you as well. Okay, um, so as I told you, there is this very complex history that happens to all galaxies, but also we can see that um, some galaxies' properties are correlated to one another and uh, the chemical enrichment is correlated to the stellar mass which is also correlated to the star formation history so we all, we usually start looking at those things with empirical laws so this is a famous empirical law here on the left that's the mass on the y-axis metallicity relation there's a handful there are a handful of galaxies there this is the first um uh version of these these uh, relation. A more updated version of this relation, the mass metallicity relation, is this here. So we, we had like six galaxies, seven galaxies, and this plot now has 20 or 40,000 galaxies. And we can start seeing, think, seeing more things. So we see that galaxies which have more mass are more evolved. We already saw this, and this relation still is still here with lots of galaxies. But if we start seeing there is a scatter, so it's not a one-to-one -one relation. There is a scatter. 
and we're going to talk a bit about this scatter in a second. And we also see that this relation is not linear, log linear. It has like a saturation which could be, which could be correlate, related to outflows and inflows of gas. Okay, so that's the mass metallicity relation. There's also the mass star formation rate relation, uh, where galaxies with higher masses, they also form more stars. And putting the three together, there is the mass metallicity star formation rate relation, the three parameters together. And this is the first version of these relation to my knowledge. But let me go back to the version I'm going to show in this talk, which was shown in this version by Manucci et al. So again, that's the metallicity uh, here in Y axis, in the X axis, the star formation rate in bins of stellar mass. So stellar mass is how many stars were formed in a galaxy in throughout its whole history. Uh, star formation rate, it's how many stars were formed yesterday and the metallicity, how much the gas in a galaxy was enriched. So that's this relation is really, really rich when you want to study what happens with, with galaxies in general. But it has a problem. Oh, actually, it has many problems. It could have many problems. Uh, first, this relation was uh, done for SDSS galaxies. I'm going to explain SDSS uh, in a second, not in a second, in a few minutes. So there are problems with sample selections, aperture effects, things like that. But I'm going to, as I already told you, concentrate on the contamination by the dip. Okay, uh, if you want to know why this is like this, you ask me afterwards. Okay, so I've told you why we should worry about those empirical laws in galaxies. Now, let me talk a bit about the dip. So uh, let me start with an analogy. Let's imagine we want to study, we want to, to uh, do some weather forecast, right? We want to predict how, if it's going to rain in a few, in a few hours or not. Um, you could say, oh, let's only look at those types of clouds, cumulus, which are very dense and they predict the rain. Let's forget about everything else. Um, would your predictions be accurate? I don't know because I don't know anything about meteorology, but I suppose not because you're forgetting lots of things that happen in the atmosphere, right? It's the same thing in the galaxy or in the galaxy, I'm sure that you're going to make serious mistakes if you just forget about the diffuse gas and you just concentrate on the H2 regions. And usually what we usually do, we, we say, oh, this galaxy is a... Uh, it's very similar to a, a giant H2 region, which they are not. Okay, so where is the DIG? So the DIG, again, it stands for diffuse ionized gas. It was first found in, the, um, in high altitudes outside of the plane of the Milky Way in the 60s or 70s. So we found this DIG there before. And then after we looked at um, some edge-on galaxies and we saw the dig in, uh, in outside of the plane of those edge-on galaxies. But the dig is also in between spiral arms of galaxies. You can see here in this plot by Zureta, uh, they've removed all the H2 regions and you see the emission here in green is from the dig, green and red and, and everything else. And it's also in the bulges of late or early type galaxies, if there is any gas there in the bulge, okay? So the dig is there. That's just a gas which is very diffuse. Okay, so I thought we could, um, I could ask you a few questions while I go along, just two questions, just to know if, you, if I need to stop and go back and explain something again, right? just to make this a bit more interactive. So I'm opening the first question right now. I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to show you what this thing is. Stop sharing. Now start sharing the other window. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start us accepting answers for this question, which is related to something I'm telling you about. 
And as soon as somebody or a few people start answering, I'm going to see some bars here indicating whether you've you've answered one question, one answer or the other. Okay, so keep this tab open and answer when you when you can, and I'll come back to the answers after we discuss a bit more. Okay, let me go back to the presentation here. Tab. Oh, I see. I see one answer ready. That's good. There we go. Right. Okay. So I've told you what the dig is. Now, uh, what are the characteristics of the dig? So the dig is uh, diffuse. So it has a low electron density, and it has a higher electron temperature higher than H2 regions. And more importantly, uh, emission lines like emission line ratios such as S2 to H alpha and 2 to H alpha, 3 to H beta usually, they are higher in the dig than in H2 regions. You can see here S2 to H alpha. You see here in the H2 regions, which are those little blobs there, it's kind of greenish, so small. And in the dig between the arms, it's much, much higher. So it goes from 0.3 to 0.8. Not only that, um, there are some studies that show that 30 to 60% of the total H alpha emission in a galaxy comes from the dig in comparison to H2 regions. So it's not a little, it's a lot. And there have been several culprits, uh, candidates for the dig ionization because it cannot be just OB stars like in H2 regions because the because you see there's a high electron temperature, those emission lines are enhanced, so you need some ionizing source, which is harder. So candidates have been cosmic rays, shocks, turbulent dissipation, leakage of photons from star forming regions. So the, the, uh, um, the photons that escape are harder as well. We're going to concentrate today on the photonization by Holmes. HOMES stands for hot, low mass, evolved stars. And uh, please remember this acronym because I'm going to use it a lot. And I'm going to explain it a bit more in a second. Okay. So um, let's talk a bit about the HOMES. So HOMES is an acronym that was invented uh, in this paper by Flores Fayado. And we used to call them post AGBs. You may have seen this in the literature as post AGBs if you don't work with stars. But they're not like post AGBs as people who do stellar evolution call post AGBs. That's why we invented this new name. So it's not only post AGBs, it could be stars that are not going through a, an AGB phase and have never going to. But it's the phase between a galaxy leaving the giant branch and going into a white dwarf uh, phase, okay? So all this phase here, including when there is a planetary nebula and afterwards, okay? So it's all this phase here. This is an HR diagram, and I'm showing here um, stars of different masses of 0.2, uh, sorry, point, no, one stellar mass, two and four stellar masses, and how they evolve in this diagram. And this is color coded by the QH1. What is the QH1? That's the rate of emission of uh, ionizing photons that ca are capable of, of ionizing the hydrogen. So photons with energy higher than 13.6 uh, electron volts. Okay. So you see that they emit a lot of those photons. And now here, not so much when they start uh, start getting to the white dwarf phase, but during all this phase, they emit a lot of photons. And also those photons are really hard. So this is, uh, now it's color coded by uh, Q helium one to Q helium hydrogen one. So how many photons are capable of ionizing the helium divided by how many photons are capable of ionizing the hydrogen. And blue here, it's when it's really hard. So you see that the radiation coming from those homes is really hard. That's what we need to ionize the dig. And homes are just the end, uh, uh, they, they are in a 
we know that there are those stars in a galaxy that they evolve, they become homes, and they should be in every galaxy, right? Uh, so this idea started, we started working a bit more on this idea in a project called Seagull. You can see Laerte there, he used to be part of this group. Well, he was part of this group. Uh, when we started looking at galaxies from the SDSS, and uh, this is the SDSS. SDSS stands for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Many of you have, may have heard of it, but for the new people, for the younger people, the SDSS was a revolution in astronomy. It started uh, a bit before I started my master's and PhD. And before the SDSS, people used to have like six galaxies or 10 galaxies or 100 galaxies. That was a huge sample. SDSS changed that when it came with samples of a million galaxies. And then we had to start doing everything automatically. We couldn't do everything by, by eye anymore. So you, it observed a million spectra and 300 million images of galaxies. And it was a fiber spectroscopy survey. So for each galaxy, you put a fiber of three arc seconds in the, um, uh, in the telescope plane, and it took the spectra of the central part of galaxies. So we created some uh, tools to automatically analyze those data. And what we had here, what we had were spectra like this one, and we could measure emission lines, which come from the gas, and the stellar continuum, continuum which comes from the stars. We use the cold cold starlight. Some of you may have used, it's kind of famous now, um, which uh, models a galaxy spectrum as a sum of spectra of different stellar populations. And then we applied those tools to look at this diagram here. Okay, this diagram, the first version of this diagram uh, is this one on the left. So usually people call this diagram the BPT, which stands for Bowden, Phillips, Tolevich, which were the authors of this paper. And this is the diagram of emission line ratios. So here in the horizontal axis is M2 to H alpha, and in the Y axis, O3 to H beta. And you see they saw that giant H2 regions were here in this part of the diagram, Planetary nebula here, AGNs and Linus there. Okay, that's what they had in 1981. When the SDSS came, uh, the SDSS team redid this diagram with those central, central parts of galaxies. And they saw, uh, which nobody was really expecting, I think, that this thing had like two wings, like a seagull. And this wing was kind of expected which is related to the giant H2 region. So galaxies with, which have lots of giant H2 regions, star forming galaxies. And the other wing, which is somewhat unexpected, which uh, they said, oh, well, those things had AGMs and liners. So we suppose that those galaxies also have CFITs liners. So they have an AGM, an active galactic nuclei. Uh, but there's a problem in with the with calling everything here AGNs because you're looking at a huge part of the galaxy, not only the nuclear part, and not all liners really are an AGN. So the acronym liner stands for low ionization nuclear emission regions, but not all liners are due to an AGN. And we were sus we suspected that some of those called liners are just due to homes, because there was a paper from 1994 that said that those homes would produce a, a nebular spectrum very similar to a liner spectrum. Why? Because again, they do have ionizing photons. So here's a, um, a plot of the uh, number of ionizing photons emitted by stellar populations of different ages. So you see that OB stars, which are here, they emit a lot of those ionizing photons, and it drops. But as soon as you get to the Holmes phase, 
those things still emit some photons. M many, uh, a much lower number of photons, of course, but they are much more numerous as well. Okay, so they still still can ionize things, can still ionize the gas. But as I told you, they are much harder. This is the hardness of ion the ionization um, spectrum, and you see that this is much uh, softer than for the homes. So we suspected that those things could, instead of having an AGN, they could be ionized by homes. And we took this spectrum from, from homes that we extrapolated from our starlight fits. So we had the ionizing part of the spectrum. We fed this to a photoionization code uh, and we see that we can, uh, with the this, this ionizing spectrum, we can explain every region of the BPT. This is the region of BPT diagram, okay? So they are compatible with being ionized by homes because the line ratios are okay. And then we started call, calling them, or we wanted to call them liars at some point, but we didn't. Now people do call them liars because they don't have an, an AGN, a nuclear thing that does anything, it's just homes. The other thing that is uh, um, compatible with homes is how much H alpha luminosity there is. So this is this thing here is the H alpha luminosity that we observe divided by the H alpha luminosity expected from old stars. And you see that when this thing is small, this number is small, the galaxy is compatible with being ionized just by homes, the things which are the faintest things you can have in a galaxy. You don't need anything else. You don't need star formation. You don't need any activity uh, in, in, a, in a supermassive black hole. If you have anything that is greater than that, of course, you need an additional source, right? So we've um, empirically uh, said that if you have this cut here, uh, of three angstroms. I'm going to tell you about this in a second. Uh, these things which have equivalent widths smaller than three angstroms, they are ionized by Hobbes. Okay, what is that? That's the equivalent width of H alpha, which, which is something that you can observe in a spectrum very, uh, very easily. And this thing is not very easy. So you see those two things are very well correlated. So we can just use the equivalent width of H alpha to separate things which are ionized by Hobbes and things which need uh, an extra source. Okay, so takeaway messages, homes uh, can explain the emission, like liner-like emission, uh, the emission line ratios, and they can explain how much H-alpha you see. And this changes lots of things, uh, lots of works where people suppose that those galaxies which only need homes have AGNs, right? It changes the census of galaxies. And I refer you to those papers if you want to know more. Okay. So I've talked a bit about some old work we had done and where we were worried about homes. And now I'm going to stop a bit and tell you a bit more about what we can do with a new generation type of data. So everything I told you so far was based on single spectroscopy, single fiber spectroscopy data. So one spectrum for each galaxy. Now, since the, the 2010, more or less, we've had lots of um, single observation or surveys of IFS data, uh, integral field spectroscopy or data cubes. So data cubes are, instead of having one spectrum per galaxy, we have for each galaxy many, many spectra. Okay, so here's one map that was done with a data cube. And when we have a data cube, we can now separate regions of galaxies. You can separate them by how much they meet, what ionization source it is, and etc. And that's, that's what I'm going to show you, how this helps digging out the dig. So um, I don't know if any of you remember this game. Some of you may have uh, not been born yet. This is a famous picture of um, Maradona. 
and uh, it's a famous game in this World Cup where it seems that he's up against six players of Belgium. And why do I show this picture in the middle of an astronomy talk? Because this picture is uh, uh, <laughs> is completely, um, say, biased. Because what happened was this guy here passed the ball to Maradona, who, who was here. They were trying to defend the, the goal. And look, he's really far away from those guys. He's not so close as this picture shows. And we can only see this because we have another vantage point. We have another picture. And that's the analogy I'm, going, I'm trying to, to do here. We need another vantage point to see the dig in our galaxies. Okay, so this work with data cubes was done by lots of people, some postdocs we had, some students we had. And there's some construction work going outside. I hope you're not listening to it, you're not hearing it. They started right now. Okay, now we used data cubes from Manga. Manga is um, is a continuation of the SDSS project, one of the branches of the SDSS project, and uh, it got the got data cubes for uh, ten thousand galaxies. But for each of those ten thousand galaxies, they had about a few hundred to a few dozen spectra, right? Um, so we took, we, there were about 5,000 spectrum when we did this work. And what we did is we tried to identify the dig with uh, using the equivalent width of H alpha. There are other options of doing that. But if you, if you are curious about it, you can ask me after why we didn't want, we thought those things didn't work for our case. And here is how. So this on the left is an image, an optical image of a galaxy. And on the right, it's the same galaxy, but with a map of equivalent widths from the Khalifa survey, which is similar to Manga. Okay. And you see that when there, you've got spiral arms, the equivalent width is high. When you've got interarm regions, the equivalent width is small. So what we did is that we separated regions with star formation regions which are dominated by the dig using the equivalent width. So small equivalent width, dig, high equivalent width, star formation. And if you put those things in a BPT, so these are spexels, so spexels are pixels for all those galaxies from Khalifa. And if you put them on a BPT and color code them by the equivalent width of H alpha, so this is low equivalent width in red, high equivalent width in blue, you see that they go from down, from up here to down there. So things which are, have more star formation have lower O3 to H beta, lower M to 2 H alpha. More dig, they have higher O3 to H beta, higher N to 2 H alpha. And I think it's time to check the quiz. Let's go and see how you're doing. So I'm going to show you how the answers are going. Let's go there and see. Okay. You'll see this in a second. So you see there are six people who answered something, two people who answered something else. Let's see if the majority got the right answer. Oh, yeah, you did. So those line ratios are larger in the dig. Okay, so the dig makes those ratios go up. Very good. Okay, so final and uh, question is this one. It's going to be a bit quicker because I'm almost ending my talk, but let's go to the talk again. There we go. And now you're seeing my screen again. Okay, so that's what we did. We got this galaxy 
we clean the galaxy from the Diggs pixels and we just added up these pixels which are dominated by star formation. And we can do this and uh, measure all the emission lines. So let's just add up all the H alpha in star, form in star forming pixels. Let's add up all the Antium star forming pixels. And let's divide this by the total H alpha of the galaxy, right? So you see that this can go from zero to a hundred percent. So from zero to one, depending if a galaxy only has the dick or if it only has star forming com complexes. And this is plotted as a function of the equivalent rate of H alpha of the global spectrum. And we can do that for each um, emission lines, as I said. And the, this curve here is a bit different for each emission line, right? Remember that when, because in the dig, and 2 to H alpha is larger, when you remove the dig, you remove more in 2 than you remove H alpha. So what we did is we took those corrections, we applied those corrections to SDSS data, because here, let me go back, we only had 1400 galaxies, which is a lot, which is very good to make those curves. But to make this plot, it's kind of very noisy if you only use 400 galaxies. So we applied this to 100,000 galaxies from the SDSS, those corrections. And what happened was, for galaxies where the dig was more important, the correction was larger. For which galaxies was this? Galaxies which have low star formation rate, so they have more dig than star forming regions, and galaxies which have high mass, not galaxies which have low mass, because galaxies which have low mass, they are forming more stars per uh, stellar mass, right? So this region was more affected. That's why those curves which were flat started to become like this. Because this thing here, the metallicity, what the metallicity that I'm using here is calibrated within 2 to H alpha. You can use other calibrations, and I, we've shown in our paper what other calibrations do when you do this correction. But this is what happens. And that's because we're removing the dig, which increases the N2 to H alpha. And when you remove this in increase in N2 to H alpha, it's only due to the dig, you get a different relation. And you can correct for the staff mission rate as well. You can ask me a bit more about this. And I'm um, going to tell people on YouTube there is a delay there. So I'm going to close the questions probably for you now. You're not going to be able to answer anymore. Uh, for people who are in Google Meet, I'm closing the question, the second question in a little while. And I think let's see what happens. Okay, we've got six answers to one answer. Let's see who is right. Okay, most of you got that. The contribution is greater for high mass, low star formation galaxies. Very good. Excellent. Okay, so I don't have to explain anything anymore for you. Okay, now I don't have to go back to the item two anymore. You must be tired. Okay, good. Very good. So to conclude this uh, bit about the dig, of course, what we've done so far is just a very simple correction with Manga data. And Manga, all the, pic the pixels in Manga already uh, still have the same problem as, the, as, the, as a whole galaxy because the pixel in Manga is about one kiloparsec across. In an H2 region, uh, it's like 10 parsecs, 100 parsecs. So you still have a lot of dig in, into each pixel of manga. And I've been telling people this all the time, saying someone should do something with high spatial resolution data. Someone should do, and nobody has done it so far. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this with my, with my students. And those students are all involved in trying to get some MUSE data to redo this study with higher resolution data. And if you're interested, come and talk to us. Okay, last part, I'm going to tell you very, very briefly about dust, because I know in every astrophysics talk, people talk about, uh, ask this question, so I'm saving a question 
what above does, thus is really important. So we had a question uh, similar to this thing of removing dig, which could be answered with uh, data cubes. And the, the question was this, usually when you do some stellar modeling of um, a spectral fitting in a galaxy, usually one uses a very simple model, which is uh, all the stars are here and there is a dust screen in front of the stars and you're correcting all the stars by this very simple model. Sometimes people do something a bit more uh, sophisticated with putting two dust screens, but that's not completely correct. Actually, that's very, very incorrect. That's a, just a little bit more correct, less incorrect than the simple model because a galaxy is really complex. Each uh, H2 region has its own dust attenuation and and the dust is mixed with everything, right? So we had we asked we asked a very simple question to start with, and the question was this: When you go and you have your spectrum and you uh, compute the dust attenuation from your global spectrum, what you're doing is you're mixing up regions with high dust attenuation, low dust attenuation, which are more or less luminous, and the regions which are more luminous and less attenuated are going to contribute more to your tau. But now, that's the global thing. But now, if you look at uh, each region individually, you have different taus for each region. What does this global tau represent? Is it biased in some way? And the answer is yes, it is biased. How is it biased? If you do a very simple calculation, analytical calculation, you, you see that for uh, some assumptions about the dust law and everything, this thing is always underestimated, okay? Always. And then we say, we, we said, okay, let's see if that's really true in real life and by how much this is underestimated. So we took mega galaxies again and a galaxy from news and we had galaxies which had star formation and which had very um, high quality data in each pixel, in each pixel. And we did this game here of computing the luminosity correcting point by point and computing the luminosity of H alpha correcting by the global town. And this is the result. So this is correcting point by point and this is correcting by the global one. As I said, the prediction was that this is always underestimated. So this thing should always be uh, greater one or greater than one, right? And for most galaxies, except for a few, this is greater than one. Of course, by not, not by a lot, by 5% here to 2% there, that's the difference. But those are manga galaxies, remember? And that's why we took a Muse galaxy where we have high spatial resolution. So this is the correction for the Muse galaxy, NGC 628. So this is 15%. And when we degrade the resolution to match those of Manga, it goes down and matches the, the effect we saw in Manga. So if we had all those galaxies here in Manga with Muse resolution, maybe this thing would be around here, 20%, we don't know. It's also systematic. So we think uh, we did some statistics statistics tests that show that probably those things in this part of the diagram suffer more from this effect than those things in this part of the diagram. This part of the diagram, of that part of the diagram, you see, again, is our friend equivalent with of H alpha. So things here which have more dig seem to be more affected. Okay. So it's a very quick summary of another work that we've done. So we're going to need a big hoover, a big vacuum cleaner to clean this dust that we didn't know was there. And to end up, I'm going to just make some publicity of two projects that are, I participate in. One is the TWIMP. TWIMP stands for the universe in my pocket. It's a website where you can go and find booklets written in 14 languages. And they are aimed at children, but also at the general public about astronomy they're written by astronomers and by PhD students. And if you're interested in contributing, like in um, writing a booklet or translating booklets or taking them to schools, they're completely free. Just talk to, to the organizers. You can talk to me. I can, I can forward this to the organizers. 
I've translated some to Portuguese. And also uh, to people who identify with uh, the female gender, there is this program called Supernova Foundation, which is a mentoring program uh, for PhD students and undergrad students um, in physics and astronomy, okay? And also professors and postdocs, if you want to be mentors, you could, match, could be matched up with a mentee just to provide um, some guidance during the, their studies, okay? And here I've, I put some photos of people who I've considered mentors during my, my career. Okay, finally, some thanks to the, um, some agencies who have supported this work and some agencies who are supporting the science in this country. They are really important in this time, uh, at least, but always, but in this time, uh, they are really, really important. Sociedade Brasileira de Física, Sociedade Brasileira para o Progresso da Ciência. And I'll leave you with my main takeaway message, which, which is this. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, oh, uh, that was fast. Professor Laird, please, you can ask your question. Você está no mudo. Laird, você está no mudo. Oops, very nice question, uh, okay, Natalia. Uh, one of my questions is the following. What would be the contribution of the DIGS to the galaxy continuum? I don't think it would be a lot. It, it, uh, because even the H2 regions don't contribute a lot to the galaxy continuum, at least in the optical. So the DIG would be a bit less. So say if the D contributes to 50% uh, uh, of the H alpha luminosity and the uh, H2 regions contribute to 10%, say 10% uh, to the continuum, that would be a, like just a 5% contribution. But I think 10% would be already pushing the limit. It will not be that much, but uh, uh, I don't uh, think uh, a lot. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Because my... Uh, mm. I have the following doubt. If we fit, uh, say, an uh, early type galaxy that fits your criteria of mm -hmm. being important because it in general has a high mass and the low star formation uh, rate, uh, with, uh, say that we use starlight. And uh, there is not in, the, in starlight a uh, uh, basis spectrum that uh, explains the dig so the dig light will be uh, modeled by the other components do you have uh, any idea of uh, what components are there or are they, are they? i see well and uh, those galaxies that i'm showing they you wouldn't have ellipticals there they would all be like uh yeah but types, even lip style, lip yeah. Type yeah but even so we we don't we did some tests putting like nebula continuum at some point. I did this when I was my PhD. And I remember that I was really surprised that Starlight liked it to, it liked to put intermediate age uh, spectra, intermediate age stellar populations when there was uh, a bit more nebula continuum. But you could look at the, the works by Jean Gomes, who is in Porto now. He's done some work with the nebula continuum, which could answer your questions. But yeah, that's all I re can remember now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Natalia, I have a, a question about uh, how do you estimate the metallicity of the digs? Mm -hmm. uh, is it from the photoionization model? Uh, you could estimate from photoionization models, but there are so many free parameters that I don't think it's really feasible. There are some people who have tried to do this, a uh, paper by, uh, what's her name? Nimisha, um, I forgot her surname. She used to work in Cambridge, but she tried to do it, and I remember it was really complicated. 
because there are many free parameters that you it's not it's not as easy as in h2 regions where all the parameters are kind of linked together in in the dig they are all separated so we have no idea of <laughs> how they should be linked but you could try but uh for this uh for this works you presented how how is the how is it oh done? what we did was that we removed the dig and then we just ah, got the okay. metallicity from this dh2 regions ah, okay and the thing was that if you include the, the contribution of the dig you're going to make a mistake in the metallicity that you're deriving for dh2 regions ah, okay thank you now i understand okay <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions here I have another one. Uh, <laughs> Natalia, you mentioned that when you look at the galaxies, uh, edge on galaxies, mm -hmm. you can see the, the dig above or below the, mm -hmm. the plane. How do you distinguish the dig uh, that I understand is produced by these Lomar home, Lomas homes stars mm -hmm. no? from uh, diffuse gas? I mean, uh, how do you distinguish the, the origin of the emission? Oh, uh, you, don't, you don't distinguish yet. You just see the dig. You just see a diffuse ionized gas. And the ionization source is a mystery, right, in those edge-on galaxies. Some oh, people okay. say, oh, it could be some homes which are in the halo. It could be leaking of photons from H2 regions in the plane of the galaxy that escapes. It could be some turbulence, it could be many things. And we are trying, right now I have a student who is trying to, to do some models to see whether we can say how much comes from the homes, how much comes from other sources. But you, you just see the dig. You don't know what is ionizing it. Okay, I have other questions, but I will ask it to you later. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I have another question as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know if if is there any way to to map this Holmes distribution in galaxies? Well, uh, you see the stellar continuum, and uh, you try to model the stellar continuum as uh, different stellar populations. And the Holmes are a fraction of those stellar populations. That they are just a, a quick phase of aging stellar populations. So you have to have the old stellar populations and then you can use the models to say, oh, those are, a fraction of those are in the home space. And that's more or less what we did in that, that work from uh, when we were looking at the liners and things like this. But yeah, I think that's all you can do. Um, could you, well, you could also, um, just thinking now, you could also look and see whether you see some, look in the ultraviolet perhaps, maybe, because they're going to be, but they're very faint as well. I don't think you'd see like a peak in the ultraviolet or anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Cheers. I think you can ask your question live because we don't have any, any anyone else here. Well, uh, actually, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I have the, the following problem. Mm -hmm. I have been using uh, starlight fitting by Ariel. Uh, Ariel used uh, uh, a variant of starlight where he fits uh, the UV galaxy emission together with the optical SDSS emission. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I noticed the following. Using only the co galaxy continuum, I can tell you if a galaxy is star forming, is a, a safer galaxy, or is a liner. And the, so the uh, somewhat the emission line pattern is printed in the continuum of the galaxy. And it, I wonder why this happens. A possibility, that's why I asked you before mm. the other questions, mm -hmm. is that maybe there is some uh, 
component that is not being fitted by, uh, say, a diffuse component, that, uh, that is being mimicked by other um, uh, components of the starlight basis. Mm -hmm. um, and it, maybe this can be the diffuse emission, because I can't understand why uh, the stellar emission can tell you about what is the source of the ionization, you know? Yeah. Uh, is, have you tried? Well, you have to, to send me some some results so I can look at. Because yeah. I, it's really curious, because have you... Uh, it's I can not... it, Natalia, because okay. it's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm lost, I should say. Because if I look together, I just say, oh, it's just because liners and seafoods and star forming galaxies are, have different star formation histories. That's why you can see it. But <laughs> Yeah, th that's what is, uh, Sid thinks, I, I suspect. Yeah. He thinks that uh, this is already printed in the normal stellar populations, but mm -hmm. I'm not convinced. Yeah, you'd have to test whether this is true or not. Mm. But that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think we can uh, keep this uh, this conversation in the meet, but we can stop sharing uh, to YouTube, research. Thank you, people who are watching me on YouTube. And um, if you would like to uh, contact me, you have my email address at the last slide. So go, just go back or Google me, and I'll be happy to talk to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>